Welcome, bienvenidos to today's workshop on best practices in data collection and sharing regarding sexual orientation and gender identity. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. We're facilitating today's workshop with Zach Keith and Maggie Pina from the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz County and Eva Holt from DataShare. Today's session, as you can hear, is being held in both English and Spanish with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate any written comments and questions you may have. Soon we'll switch to just simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who will give us a brief overview of CORE. Thanks, Nicole. So again, Nicole Lezen and I are two of the consultants that facilitate this countywide initiative called CORE Investments, and CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. Um, the mission of CORE is to inspire and ignite collective action to ensure Santa Cruz County is a safe, healthy community with equitable opportunities for all to thrive and to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. And so when we say words like equitable health and well-being, we mean that people's opportunities and their quality of life aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income level, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, or any of those other dimensions of diversity, or um, the ways in which we identify ourselves. And so we partner with other agencies and groups like Data Share, and then today the Diversity Center to really bring people together to look at ways that we can better align our efforts so that we really are working towards common goals, uh, common outcomes in each of these core conditions here. I'm gonna turn it over to Eva to say a few words about Data Share. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Eva Holt and I'm a social impact consultant and project coordinator for DataShare. If you are less familiar with the platform, um, this uh, DataShare platform is an interactive website with over 400 indicators from local, state, and national sources. And we aim to have the updated version of all data and reports with the most current information. DataShare is constantly changing with new indicators being added and it integrates data sets such as the safety net clinic utilization data, which was previously not easily available to the public. Um, we know that this platform and resource has been helpful for students, researchers, advocacy groups, program evaluators, grant writers, and everything. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm gonna hand it over to Zach and see if I can fix my echo. I apologize for that. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Zach Keith. My pronouns are they, them. I'm a graduate student researcher and program coordinator with the Santa Cruz Diversity Center. Um, the Santa Cruz Diversity Center has served the LGBTQ plus community for over 30 years. Um, and our mission is to inspire and support every member of the LGBTQ plus community and by creating a culture of well-being. Um, a little bit about me, I'm currently a doctoral student at UCSC, getting my PhD in developmental psychology. I study LGBTQ plus identity development. And so I work with the Diversity Center to examine best practices in data collection and how to implement data back into community outreach and programming. We started chatting about this training a few months ago and I'm so glad that it's happening. We're gonna um, do some learning around best practices. So by the end of this workshop, you will be able to identify and implement some best practices for collecting sexual orientation and gender identity um, data in your research programs or organizational surveys. We'll also work on enhancing data impact. So we hope that by the end of this workshop, you'll be equipped with some knowledge and skills to collect this kind of data in a way that maximizes its accuracy, inclusivity, and ultimately the positive impact of your work, and that you'll be able to walk out of here with the tools to make 
better decisions, not just on the collection of the data, but um, how that can better inform your programs and that understanding the needs of our community. Um, and we have a little poll just to get a temperature of the room. If you wanna go ahead and press the button. Um, our first question is when I hear I need to collect sexual orientation and gender identity and expression data, I want to do happy dance, feel a mix of excitement and apprehension, fall into a deep trance and run from the room. And then our second question is how confident do you feel in your knowledge? Um, can you teach a class? Can you have a conversation? Not so confident. What are we talking about? We see some responses are coming in. We'll give it maybe another 30 seconds or so to let everyone respond. And then we'll end the poll and share the results so everyone can see where we land. Okay, and I think we might have all of our responses in. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So we have, uh, looks like number of people that like to do a uh, happy dance when they hear that they need to collect data on sexual orientation and gender identity. So that's great. You're in the right place here with others that are also wanting to do the happy dance. And then others that feel a mix of that excitement and apprehension. And <laughs> we we will try to keep the, um, the person who, want, who wants to fall into a deep trance, we'll try to keep you uh, alive and alert here um, and hopefully find that uh, the tools that you get will be really uh, inspiring and invigorating. And kind of a uh, little bit of a bell curve there all over the place in terms of confidence level. So again, hopefully our tips and content that will be shared today will help everyone feeling uh, more confident as they walk away today. Fantastic. Thank you all for responding to that poll. It's really helpful to know when sharing this information about kind of where people are starting from um, and what their point of contact is with SOGI. So just to start broad, um, what does SOGI stand for? SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and, Ex and Expression Data. Um, it refers to information about a person's sexual orientation. So this is who they are attracted to, their gender identity, which is the gender in which they identify, and then the gender expression, which is how they present their gender. Um, you can use this glossary of terms as a reference. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna be able to go over each term and the definition for these. Um, this list provides a broad definition for sexual orientation and gender identity terms. Um, it reflects our current understandings of 2024, but it's important to mention that there is a wide variety of um, how people choose to label themselves and that there's a lot of fluidity between how these labels might manifest and their their identity or their expression to the world around them. The terminology celebrates diversity. It's important to remember that sexual and gender minorities represent a diverse range of experiences and identities. These terms are not one size fits all and their meanings and usage can evolve over time. And we acknowledge that there is no single definition for each term and that this list is not exhaustive. In providing these definitions, our aim is to promote understanding and inclusivity. So why SOGI data? Next slide, please. One more slide, please, thank you. Um, recent studies have found that consistently collecting and analyzing data on SOGI allows agencies to identify groups within the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer or questioning population that are disproportionately underserved and to direct specific outreach and services to those populations. Beginning no later than July of 2018, California state law required certain state departments, including the California Department of Public Health, to collect and report voluntary report voluntary provided self-identification about SOGI when it collects ancestry or ethnic origin information. 
In 2023, the California State Auditor released its report showing major gaps in consistent collection reporting of SOGI data by CDPH. Of the 129 forms reviewed that collected demographic data, only 24 forms were required, um, were required to collect SOGI data, and then only 17 of those collected and completed SOGI data. The vast majority of these forms were exempt for collection requirements because a third party collects the data separately. And that means that only 13% of SOGI data that is being asked to be collected is being fulfilled. This exemption severely limits the amount of SOGI data the department is required to collect. The disparities in representation are why vital bills introduced in the California State Legislature that increase the requirement to select SOGI information, such as SB 957, are so important. Thanks, Beth, for kind of giving us a framework of where, where we stand as a state in terms of collecting um, these identifiers. Um, I wanted to just share, um, you know, the three, some, some of the best practices um, to keep in mind when thinking about collecting switching data from clients or patients, et cetera. And then Zach and I will have a conversation about how they be I think Eva froze up. Nicole, uh, Nicole Lesson, do you want to jump sure. in? Sure. So um, in terms of safety and security measures, historically, marginalized groups have been harmed by research practices that exploited their identities. And the mistrust makes people very wary of sharing information. And that, in turn, can lead to really inaccurate data. So data privacy is a top priority to protect LGBTQIA plus people from discrimination. And balancing accurate data collection with privacy is especially important for marginalized identities. But there are always some challenges to honoring data privacy and collecting ident identifiable information. So for example, a small survey that asks about sensitive topics like gender identity can pose a higher risk of identification than a large national survey. So a small population in a small county, it might be possible to identify who has answered with what response. So it's really important to ensure and keep reiterating the anonymity and secure storage of data to minimize linking responses to individuals. And also it's important to be transparent about how the data will be used and to consider potential harm to respondents whenever it's collected and shared. That's why you sometimes see, for example, an asterisk on a table of data because the numbers are so small that they might identify someone. In terms of building inclusive data collection methods, there's no one size fits all approach to asking SOGI questions. As Zach mentioned, these are um, designed to, to capture uh, self identity and expression. So there are by definition, some fluid categories. Um, there are some best practices though, in, in terms of how to do this and um, share how surveys are changing, how they ask about gender. So best practices include using some multi-choice options to capture some of those nuances and integrating the element of how language around SOGI changes over time. Um, there's, a, there's consistently a need to consider how these terms are understood and to update our own um, use of these terms. And it's also, of course, very important to understand how cultural differences can affect how people answer SOGI questions, especially when you have surveys that are translated into other languages really, really important to translate them back and make sure that you aren't inadvertently introducing, for example, some pejorative slang and, and things like that. So Eva, if you're back, I'll turn it back over to you. I think I'm back, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, I wanted to share something that has been really helpful for me called the identity sorting tool. This comes from a great organization called weallcount.org, which helps answer some common anecdotes uh, that you see on the screen. Um, if I want my 
uh, if I want to be inclusive in my survey, shouldn't I use as many identity options as possible? Um, or I want to see the differences in our groups, but the sample sizes for the groups I'm worried about are too small to use. So these are questions that um, DataShare has received in the past that we struggle with, that I've struggled with in evaluations. Um, and this tool, um, and I definitely encourage you guys to explore um, this resource further. Uh, we're not going to get into it too much, but it just answers um, some questions. So number one, um, are the answer choices relevant? So the, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about fit. Um, imagine asking about sexual orientation. Do the options that you're presenting clearly represent how people identify? Can, can they see themselves in the responses? Number two is can people uh, easily answer the question? So this is about ease. Is the language clear and easy to follow? Number three, um, are the groups specific enough? So this is about specificity. Are the answer choices, you know, broad such as North American or specific like Californian from Santa Cruz? Um, you know, those don't have to do with Sochi data, but um, just kind of to think about how specific you can get um, drown, drilled down. So more specific answers give you clearer results. And will we get reliable data? So this is a question around certainty of, um, of the data. Do we have enough people in each group to answer um, the question and be able to draw meaningful conclusions? So there's always a trade-off. Sorry, there's not like a secret answer. Um, it's not a magic uh, answer for every situation. There's always gonna be a trade-off. Sometimes getting really specific um, can make it harder to get reliable data. So that's something that considering, you know, your goal of your survey, um, you want to be weighing. And I definitely encourage you to keep looking at these tools. Um, thank you for posting in the chat the link to this organization. And I wanted to um, talk with Zach and Nagy about how they navigate this tension. Um, so... Um, We'll start with Zach and Maggie, you want to hop in as you like, but can you share with us how you go about integrating safety measures, privacy concerns, and inclusive data collection methods in your surveying and tools? I know Absolutely. you're going to walk us through a tool as well. Yeah, so we have a survey called the Community Connection Survey, and this is a form that we ask each participant one time a year to fill out for us. And it collects a variety of demographic information and gives us an understanding of how we can best serve who's coming through our doors and participating in our programs. So I'm going to share that form with everybody. Fantastic. I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Um, the first piece, when we're talking about safety measures, um, when we were designing this survey, we had a couple of different ways in which we wanted to implement safety. Um, the first piece is to make sure that all of the demographic information that we're asking was multiple selections so that participants never felt limited to having just like one way of representing their identity. Um, for us in our organization, it felt important to be able to provide a spectrum of what these identity labels might be. Um, these identity labels were also informed by the survey materials that we had used previously. So visiting local schools, visiting um, our local programming, when people were using this other category and we saw, we noticed an increase, um, we were able to start using those and filling those blanks in for more people to self-identify. Um, other pieces that are really important of how we chose to maintain our privacy um, we try to make sure that anytime someone is filling out our community connection survey, that we have somebody who has SOGI knowledge present. So if there are questions about terms or any kind of just wanting to be able to talk through these experiences, there's someone accessible to them. Um, when it comes to privacy measures, they, this might look different for each organizational need. Um, for us, this meant making sure that the direct responses were stored in a secure Google Drive. And that's any surveys that were collected via paper were immediately input and secured behind a locked container. Um, you will also notice that we have questions such as, do you identify as transgender? Although somebody might identify as, some, as a gender identity that they don't align with their natural sex at birth, whether they hold the identity label as transgender was an important piece of information for us. And we found that simple difference between demographic questions can tell you a lot about who you're serving. 
Um, as Eva mentioned, one of the most important measures we took was to make SOGI an inclusive question that allowed participants to holistically represent their identities. Um, for example, this included a diverse array of what these identities look like and the ability to self-select, and the other category being able to input anything that maybe is not being represented on this survey. I'd like to add a few things too. I think, you know, the the questions that we're asking when we talk about SOGI are very personal and they're, um, you know, kind of private matters in a lot of ways that we normally don't ask strangers, you know, what their sexual orientation is. Um, but just when we pass out this form, we we talk about you can leave anything you want blank. You don't have to answer all of these questions. We're at, we ask and we tell them why we're asking these questions. So we're asking these questions so that we can better understand who we're serving. We're asking these questions so that we can um, understand how to shift our programming to better suit the needs of our the people that are coming in to the center. Um, and I think one of the parts I really want to talk about is like separating that, do you identify as transgender? Um, because I think it's important to just not see a trans person as this is a, a trans man, a trans woman. This is a man who may also identify as being trans. Um, and this kind of feedback came from community members who said when we had trans man, trans woman as options for gender identity that they felt kind of icky about it. So we're trying to, you know, uh, take feedback from our communities so that these surveys aren't actually harming them when we talk about safety. Thanks, Minky. Um, I'll also say that something that you shared offline um, about creating a safe space, I think is relevant. So it's not just that, you know, staff understands the terminology and explains it well um, to um, patients or clients or program participants. Um, you, you also mentioned kind of like, you know, the need uh, for uh, people to feel welcomed in a space and how a simple thing like a poster saying, you know, we're all welcome here or a, um, a tag on your shirt, um, you know, that is inclusive uh, can really help people feel safer um, in responding. So I don't know, you know, this is a pretty diverse group of people, but if anyone else wants to share in the group some of the things that they do in their, um, in their work around safety and inclusivity that we might learn from as well. You can just jump in. And you can share it on the chat. Yeah, Melanie um, says an invitation to share pronouns is one of the strategies. And that makes sense. Do you want to uh, say any more about that, Melanie? Hi, <laughs> I'm Mel Zaragoza and I use she, her pronouns. Um, uh, it really helps when it comes to kind of the insecurity that people might have about misgendering, when you're introducing yourself to kind of take the lead and say, hi, this is who I am. And these are the pronouns that I use. It helps invite others to feel comfortable and safe to um, identify themselves and their pronouns back to you. And uh, it's just that simple signaling that I'm I'm gonna be a safe person and I am taking responsibility for, for having an understanding of um, us existing beyond a binary that kind of is dominant in our culture. Um, okay. Um, so I want to move on. Karen, 
Is that distracting? Does it sound okay? okay. Um, I want to talk a little hear you. bit. Yeah. You can hear me. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some best practices and analysis. So um, once you get the data back from these forms, unless anyone has any more questions now um, around the forms and collecting the data. There was so, one thing I wanted to add, Ava. Yes, please. Um, so we don't ask our clients what their sex assigned at birth is. We are not providing medical care. Um, and so I think it's really looking at the questions that you're asking and finding out if, you know, are they meeting your reporting needs? Like, or are they intrusive and evasive? I don't need to know somebody's sex assigned at birth to show them respect and help them get connected to our center, right? So I think, again, getting curious about why are you asking that question and how is it being used? Thanks for that clarification, Nikki. Um, yeah, and then, right, and then what do you do once you have this data? Um, so analyzing data about um, SOGI indicators uh, is similar to analyzing other data. There's just some extra things to consider, um, a few points to keep in mind. So demographic survey data of minority groups can mean that you have a small sample size. So I think that sometimes people get really hung up on that. Oh, it's going to be too small. So Studying SOGI can be tricky because there might not be enough people in each group to analyze the data, especially if you're a wide, you know, ranging program of services and um, you have a big net um, or if you have a small net too. Um, so one thing that you can do um, to think about small sample sizes, um, you know, with common with this uh, smaller survey issue is adding qualitative questions. Um, so this can help if you need to suppress the numbers for privacy or if the numbers are too small to be conclusive. Um, so that's one key strategy for that. Um, another tactic in the analysis is to group people together to make the analysis easier. However, this can hide important information. information. So just be sure you're being clear about how you're defining the grouped categories. Um, so, you know, of course, combining and se uh, separate identity groups depends on what you're trying to learn from the data. So if you're just trying to get a basic overall picture and you do some combination, that might be fine. But if you're really trying to um, do some more targeted um, uh, analysis, that might not really work for you. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're reporting the information you actually have from your survey. So for example, if you ask a question about gender, that's man, or woman, and sex, male and female, those are different. Um, so if you want to report both, you need to be asking both questions. And um, we know that uh, sexual orientation and identity can be complex, but just be clear that your data is reflecting what the survey is actually, has actually asked so that um, you have accurate responses. Um, and I want to get back in our conversation with Zach and Minnie. Um, can you share with us about uh, how you integrate some of these recommendations in your analysis of the data? So, yeah, um, absolutely. Zach, yeah, okay, go for it. <laughs> so, um, I think one piece is that we have several surveys that go out to different parts of our community. Um, I showed you our community connection survey, and this goes out to all the participants. But sometimes we might have a survey that's only growing to maybe a group of five or 10 people of a different group. So this might not be enough data to run a more complicated analysis or maybe answer some of our bigger questions. So one thing that qualitative data can do that allows for meaningful information about the LGBTQ plus people that you're serving um, is by allowing for you to ask maybe just one or two questions. It doesn't have to be a streamline of questions that you're asking for it. Thinking really strongly about what your intention is behind asking them to fill out this material. Is your intention that you're just wanting to get demographic information for reporting 
or are you wanting to understand how you can best serve your LGBTQ plus clients? Um, for example, it might just be an open-ended question that says, how can our organization better support your experience with our services? And I think an important part when we think about um, asking these broader open-ended questions and being mindful that we all are, I'm sure, are busy and trying to make the most of our time each and every day to be able to serve our clients the best of our ability. And qualitative data, especially if you're asking it to larger groups, can become a lot. One recommendation that I always have when it comes in terms of aggregating into categories is that when you have qualitative data, looking at the first 10, 15, maybe even 20 responses and seeing what themes you see, uh, you find coming up. This might be a thematic analysis to so some of you are familiar with qualitative data. Um, this can be really helpful in helping you streamline your process of collecting this information. So let's say I have a survey, I send out to 10 people, they fill out the question of how can I, our organization best support your well-being needs? I, we look through those responses and we come up with themes. You know, maybe one theme is offering more diverse programming. Maybe one theme is having more queer inclusive things on our walls. And we would be, then be able to, you know, the next 15, 20, 50 participants we see, instead of having to go through each line and trying to code it, we can be able to go through and tag like, oh, this is about environment, safe, feeling safe in our environment. This is about our program and services. And then when you're looking through and you're trying to do these bigger hauls of data, you can just look directly at like, okay, this category for having a safe environment. These are what the, the participants were saying. So this can be a way to really help you balance um, having small data uh, populations. And also it allows for you to get a more holistic understanding of the person's experience. I find that a lot of our qualitative data when we share it, we get some not only beautiful feedback, but we get to know the person in a much more intimate and holistic way. Um, and this really informs our strategies when it comes to programming and our outreach, um, or even how we like share the impact we make on our community. So these are some strategies when it comes to qualitative data that we can use in a way that's both manageable and allows you to get a more full representation of who this person or who this client is to you. Um, and one other piece to talk about is that the language and culture of sexual and gender diversity is always growing, especially in contemporary society where we have access to digital technology and a variety of community services. And so SOGI data at its core has a common understanding that if this growing language is surrounding sexuality, gender identity, and gender expression, and although culture and language language will continue to grow as we develop, um, understanding that the core foundations, so that's the sexuality, gender identity, and gender expression, can allow for you to have flexibility and adjustment when you're creating your survey and evaluation tools. Um, a fantastic way that we've already talked about that this can again be mirrored is allowing for that other category for people to self-identify. Um, other strategies are involved allowing yourself to update your surveys and evaluations as you're coming to learn more about SOGI data. Um, the Diversity Center offers a variety of different trainings on if you're wanting to be able to grow your vocabulary around um, gender and sexual diversity, or if you're wanting to get more um, in depth about how your tools can mirror what your community needs are. But these are some ways that whether you have a huge data set or you have some small data set, you're able to manage them and make really meaningful impacts with how you're serving your LGBTQ plus clients. And Ava, I know I kind of went on a little tangent there. So if you have any questions or wanted to ask further, please feel free. Um, no, I think, I think you covered what um, some of the questions that I was going to ask you. Um, Maggie, I don't know if you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, um, I think um, so the the community connection survey that we use, we're primarily using that to understand how many unduplicated people we're serving each year, right? And so um, we uh, periodically throughout the year will uh, share other surveys so that we can better understand if we're, our services are actually meeting our, our mission. Um, and so I think there's ways in which you can ask for SOGI information in a survey that is anonymous, that may also maybe help you get that data that someone maybe isn't quite comfortable sharing on an, on an intake form, if you will. 
So I think there's ways to get creative about collecting that info. Um, and it will signal to, you know, people get scared. They don't want to say the word gay. They don't know what to say. Um, but honestly, as a as a queer person, if somebody asks me my soji, it signals to me at least they're curious or they're acknowledging that there is, you know, um, gender diversity and there are different sexual orientations. So just I think people get caught in the fear of it. But in reality, it can be very affirming to have a, a form or a tool that has your clients feel seen. I would love to add to that too. Um, I have another survey here that we use. Um, this is our anonymous trans and non-binary well-being survey. So this is one of those anonymous surveys like Maggie was just talking about. And um, I, although this is a longer part of a survey, I really wanna focus on some of these questions that we have asking. Um, similar to what Maggie was just mentioning, questions like how do other aspects of your identity intersect with your experience as trans or a non-binary person? Um, what this, what questions like this allow for us to be able to get a more thorough understanding than what a Likert scale or what maybe um, just a ranking scale might offer is understanding the process of how this queer person is making meaning with its experience of coming through our services, of interacting with community members, um, of understanding themselves and where they're at in their process. I think oftentimes one piece of soji is that there's an idea that once you find your identity or you become confident using these terms that that's it you've like found the golden ticket and you're done with it and really uh queerness in a lot of ways is a constant journey and process and so what questions like this offer are be able to get a more thorough glimpse and insight into what the, what part of that process they're in right now so that you can really tailor the ways in which you're showing up for your clients in the most effective way and how you're reporting their experiences um, one other piece, just kind of looking back onto it, we do still have pieces of Likert scale. Um, this ranges from personal questions about their identity, um, all the way to how they're experiencing their identity in other areas, such as their work, their access to healthcare services, their ability to use restrooms, et cetera. Um, so this is one of our larger surveys that goes out to our trans and non-binary participants. But it's a way in which we're able to utilize the information that we've received thus far from a community to be able to inform the strategies of how our data evaluation tools are being used and created. And I'm wondering if we could share how collecting the qualitative data, and I, I will just plug AI on theming out your qualitative responses because we, I know we're all have uh, a lot of things going on and sometimes capacity can be an issue. So um, definitely use whatever AI tools um, you feel mo most comfortable with to do a glean of your qualitative data if it's feeling overwhelming as, um, as a starter. Um, I know, you know, don't rely on it, but definitely a good starter. Um, so I wanted to say that before I forgot. And then um, I did want to hear about how, like, if you have any examples of how um, when you've looked at the qualitative data that you have collected, how then you've transferred that learning into, okay, now we're going to deliver this program differently, or now we're going to change this practice in our agency. Um, I'm curious about how that has worked. Yeah, so I think there's a couple, oh, Maggie, did you want to share? Well, let's see what you're going to share, and then I'll go after you. Yeah. Um, I think one way in which that I've noticed that a lot of the qualitative um, data has been incredibly valuable for us is that when we have larger events that maybe we're only putting on once a year, um, it really informs a lot of the accessibility needs that are requested. I feel like a prime example, Maggie, I don't know if you're going to share the same. We recently had a queer prom experience and we had youth filling out that we want, they wanted um, compost to be there. And it's just like, like minor pieces at times, such as like, oh, let's make sure there's more accessibility to compost. Um, make sure that the sensory needs that are happening are present. And other pieces can be really larger constructs of such as offering, uh, being able to offer more access to clothing and wardrobe pieces, different tastes in music, 
Um, and even just like hearing the recounts of how that experience went for them and one of our neon dream, our queer prom evaluations, we asked them like, imagine you're back on this dance floor, what was this like for you? And we got to hear some beautiful tales of like, this is the first time I've felt like I could really be myself. And this is um, the first time that I felt like I was like in community and I was able to like be free of like who I was. And those narratives not only help our programming and the way that we're showing up and structuring those pieces, but also helps us as the uh, as the people who are facilitating and working on these projects and connecting with these youth, um, have an understanding of what this impact is. Um, this is not only really helpful for our shareholders and stakeholders to be able to demonstrate the impact that's being created, but it's also a really empowering moment to know like what kind of change and, cha and way we're being able to make a difference in that community. So I think there's both a, a value behind the technical aspects that it allows the participants to share with you in a really me meaningful and authentic way, as well as the way in which you get a more uh, intimate and thorough understanding of what these experiences are like for the people that you're serving and how best you can show up for them in that space. Yeah, I, I feel like, um, you know, the the testimonials, if you will, are so much more valuable in terms of shaping programming. Um, one of the questions we ask, uh, so we do school visits to the different like GSA clubs uh, that are on campus. And one of the questions we ask uh, is, uh, let's see here, what would, uh, what would make my school a safer environment? What would make your school a safer environment for you and other students? Um, and one of them said, like, the bullying needs to stop. Parent education. Others respecting us more. Stop the homophobic stuff. Uh, the random use of slurs needs to stop. Um, it's already pretty safe. Um, being able to use the boys' bathroom without being yelled at. Um having kids not bully us. So we get a lot around the bullying, right? So this could help influence um, a workshop that we offer at the schools. So that's kind of how we're applying some of that, the, the questions that we're asking to the services we're providing. Thank you for sharing. Um... Yeah, I can already, I already see those themes as well. So um, thank you for that. I, I don't know um, where, let's see, why don't we open it up to the group? Um, and um, there's just so much community knowledge and I see some folks that I know work in this space. So, um, you know, watch out or you might be voluntold. But uh, <laughs> I would love to hear how this is landing um, with this group and um, how you have, what strategies you've employed around um, collecting qualitative data. Um, and then if you have any experiences with aggregating categories, kind of the two strategies that we talked about, um, you know, for small sample sizes. And, you know, what, what has been some challenges and what has been some things that have come out of that. So I don't know if anyone wants to share or share about something else. I know, I think that we, hi Lisa, I don't know if we've met officially, but I know that we have used some behavioral health data on the DataShare platform and we've had to suppress numbers in the past um, around transgender identifying community members. So I don't know if you wanna to speak to how that process is internally, just so folks, you know, you work with a, a very specific database. Um, it might be helpful for people to understand a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I'm not sure how much I can add. I know that we obviously do collect that data and we've reported out and we have had some small numbers and so obviously always needing to be very um, sensitive to um, disclosure, obviously, for behavioral health data. Um, but unfortunately, I can't um, answer too much more than that. Uh, Claudette, who is actually also from behavioral health, might have something to add. Um, so I'll invite her to jump in if there's anything she'd like to add at this time. 
Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about the, if there's been a historical context of, of suppressing that information, but it does make sense if, if we're worried about people being identified, since we'll also put the, you know, we provide like the location where they're receiving services, that demographic information, so I could see it being, uh, yeah, too much information if we're sharing that in the, in the data share platform. But uh, we definitely collect it and have it uh, internally for for review. Eva, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, do you know, or does anyone here have experience with aggregating or clumping categories um, of identities together um, with their analysis? I'd be curious to hear if anyone is doing that um, as a strategy. And thank you, Claudette and Lisa, for sharing. Um, I can speak a little bit to the aggregation strategy that we use. Um, this is still an ongoing process and like how we want to conceptualize these categories. Um, I think one way in which we conceptualize, I'll start, I'll just use sexuality as an example. Um, we know that sexuality can have a large spectrum of how people self-identify. Sometimes there are even micro labels that they may use underneath those. So we aggregate um, in a way where we identify as plurisexual. So these are people who have attraction to more than one gender. So this might include bisexual, pansexual, um, or whatever kind of like spectrum of uh, being attracted to more than one gender might fall under. So we have that as plurisexual. Um, we, we categorize as asexual that also has umbrellas that uh, kind of nest underneath it. So for those of you who are more familiar with the SOGI terms, you might know what aromantic means or biromantic means. Um, these kind of categories we cluster under one, and this is to show that there is a spectrum of which people may not be um, experienced sexual or romantic attraction. Um, other ways in which these aggregations might pan out is that we might have um, single sex attraction as one category. So this is like our gay, lesbian, um, or even heterosexual uh, participants being placed into one aggregation. So that's one where, you know, we might have anywhere from like 10 to 15 identity labels of sexuality existing, and we are categorizing them into about three. Um, and this uh, is important to acknowledge too, of just being mindful what kind of analysis you're wanting to run with this, because the more and more you aggregate data, the more and more that it kind of removes itself from the individual who's being part of this experience. So you just wanna make sure that you're being mindful when you're aggregating these categories about like how you're choosing to represent them in the larger model or statistic that you're using. Thank you for sharing. I think that's helpful. Um, I'd like to um, just share kind of the key takeaways that we talked about today in some broad categories. So um, hopefully this has been informative and you've learned some new strategies and best practices for this work. Um, we have these five, I have a slide that says, you know, five key takeaways, don't worry, everything will be shared. So. Um, if you um, need to look at it again, including also the definitions and glossary that um, Zach went over briefly in the beginning of the call. Um, so one, just tell people why their data is being collected. Um, you know, keep that as the forefront of any data collection. And then uh, SOGI research is just like doing any other good research. So all the ways in which we think about implementing surveys in other spaces or with other um, demographic categories, um, those all apply here as well. Um, for those of you uh, like me that like a one clear direction, um, this is not that space. Um, so there is no one perfect way to collect SOGI data. So um, I invite you all to, uh, if that is an uncomfortable concept, um, we have some great resources um, that we're gonna share with you to kind of get more comfortable with that 
fluidity of, of movement of language and movement of identity sorting and those pieces. Um, and then to keep in mind that the language and cultural pieces, um, the translations can be complicated. It's not just, um, you know, uh, word by word translations. It's, it can be very regional based. Um, so um, whenever translating, um, always good to have um, extra eyes on, on the materials. And then that privacy and safety concerns are real and serious. Sometimes I think, I know when I'm doing a lot of surveying, I just kind of end up checking that box. Okay, I've done my like, you know, safety or privacy, you know, checkbox of, of this methodology. But um, with this particular information, these are real and serious concerns. And so um, keep that in mind um, when you're collecting this data. Um, for those of you that want to continue your journey, your learning journey, we have some great resources and always more to add. If there's anything that this group um, has um, gotten value from that isn't on this list, um, please send it to us and we will add it. Um, so we have the Do No Harm Guide from the Urban Institute. Um, again, and uh, the We All Count identity sorting tool. Some um, great like kind of 20 page workbooks to work through um, for some framing. And, um, and hopefully you will find these um, to be helpful. So um, we just really wanna thank you all for your time today. I really wanna thank the Diversity Center and CORE. Um, and if anyone wants to add anything else, now is the, Good time for that. We have just a couple minutes. I know that um, the Nichols have a couple things um, we want them to share as well. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Maybe we can uh, quickly show a, a few remaining slides here. We just also want to echo our thanks to Zach and Evan, Maggie, especially for all the preparation and great content uh, that you shared with all of us today. Uh, we would love to uh, get participants feedback today about the session, things that you found helpful, anything that we can do to continuously improve these core institute events. Uh, Giselle is putting the links in the chat to fill out a feedback survey, either in English or in Spanish. Um, you can do that even after you leave the event. You don't need to stay in the meeting to do that. Um, and we also want to remind folks that if you haven't had a chance yet to fill out the core institute participant survey, um, which is kind of a broader chance to provide feedback about core institute events and other training and capacity building needs. Um, we have a few more days left where the survey will be open. So we would welcome and encourage all of you to fill that out if you have not yet. The first 100 people who complete the survey uh, can be eligible to receive a Visa gift card, a $20 Visa gift card. So if that um, is motivating to you. If it buys a few extra cups of coffee in a week, then uh, <laughs> encourage you to fill out that survey. And then last but not least, we know that many of you are aware that the core investments request for, for proposals or RFP recently was released. And so part of the role that Nicole Lesnar and I play is offering training and technical assistance throughout the application period. So that really is gonna be our focus for the next couple of months. Um, we'll have fewer of these kind of topic-based coffee chats and more specific uh, training, guidance, technical assistance on um, the core RFP. And our role really is to help organizations think about how to apply or incorporate some of the core concepts around collective impact, equity, core conditions for health and well-being, how you might incorporate those things in your proposals. So we have lots of opportunities coming up some this week, some open kind of informal office hours where you can bring your questions and we'll do our best to, as a group, uh, talk through them. And then we have a structured training this Friday on developing a statement of need and strengths with, with an equity lens. So anytime you see training, it means that we'll come with some prepared content and exercises to help you think about how to uh, prepare that section of your proposal. Office hours, more informal, we don't present anything. It's really just come with your questions. And then if you want more individualized technical assistance, sign up for a TA session um, using the um, Core RFP TA sign up link. And that's more of an individualized way to get assistance from one of the core consultants, either Nicole Lezen 
or me or our other colleague, Crystal Caballero. I think with that, we will just say a final set of thank yous to our presenters, to Stella for interpreting, for Gisela for also interpreting and keeping up with all the chat translations. Um, we really couldn't do it without a team approach. So thank you all for being here. <laughs>